On this episode, we have the author of this book, Change, How to Make Big Things Happen, Professor Damon Santola, director of the Network Dynamics Group at the Annenberg School for Communication. He is at UPenn. Damon, welcome to the show. Thanks, Armin. I'm glad to have you on. I like colors, and your book has many colors on the front, which is wonderful. <laughs> Before we get into change, how did you get into your current position at University of Pennsylvania? Um, well, it depends how far back you want me to go, but basically, uh, I started off grad school in philosophy, and I was really interested in some of the, the deeper topics about social cooperation, um, ethics, and also the philosophy of science. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and what wound up happening was that most of the philosophical debates I encountered, um, especially in the last 20 years, what they would do is they would take some result from you know, either a biologist or a psychologist or a sociologist, and they would use that as like an axiom, and they would derive a set of consequences from that. And what frustrated me about this sort of style of doing philosophy, which had become kind of mainstream analytic philosophy, was that the entire structure of the argument depended on what, what was essentially scientific finding, and they were treating it as axiomatic, but science isn't axiomatic, right? Science is this continuing evolving thing that we sort of develop as we go. And sometimes there are nonlinearities and surprises just around the corner, right? And so part of what's happening as we do scientific work is where we're figuring out the space that we're in. Um, and so philosophers don't really work that way. And, you know, for the philosopher, the space is well defined at the outset and just sort of set in stone. And then you kind of build a structure inside of it. And, uh, and I found that to be a, an important kind of awakening. Um, and so I spent the summer at the Santa Fe Institute, which is a complex systems um, research center and kind of think tank, uh, but basically geek camp where a bunch mm -hmm. of people go and they kind of play for a summer. Um, and that really took me up and made me realize that what I wanted to do um, was more like what was going on at Santa Fe than what I was doing in my, in my philosophy PhD. And so, um, so yeah, I, I was working with Dan Dennett, um, and he actually, as a philosopher, encouraged me to go study science because he's sort of a, a fan of the sciences. Um, and so I, at that time, moved to Cornell, and I wound up getting into a program that was run by Steve Strogatz, who's a you know physicist and mathematician. I've had him on the show. Um, oh, so you know Steve? That's great. Yeah. So so Steve had run this program at, at Cornell that was like it was at the time they were called Igerts, but Basically, it's an interdisciplinary training program through some faculty group that decides on a theme. So there are some run, uh, you know, in the theme of like ecology and some run in the theme of like development. And so Steve's was developed and ran in the theme of complex systems and nonlinear dynamics. And so it was like John Guggenheimer was there, like there a lot of big names, people who like thought about, you know, chaos theory, complex systems theory, dynamical system theory. And they were all kind of working in this space. Um, and of course, for me, the exciting thing was to think about how social science could touch all that. Um, and uh, I mean, historically, this is sort of a funny bit, but I probably would have come in through economics because I wanted you know, to kind of dovetail through that. And I was spending time at the Brookings Institution. There were a bunch of economists there that seemed like a natural fit. Um, and, uh, and economics wasn't one of the options you could select on the website when you were applying to this PhD program. If you were going to apply to Steve's program, you had to select some others. And so sociology was the only other choice. So I chose sociology and thence I became a sociologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I did this PhD program at Cornell, which was this, you know, fantastic fit. And everyone was thinking about, you know, similar problems. Even, obviously, lots of people weren't in this complex systems group, but um, there was, there was, I would say, a, a kind of a, a spirit of the day, um, which I think has moved on largely in sociology, but there was like a five-year window when there was a lot of activity. I mean, basically you had Steve Sturgatz at Cornell and Duncan had just moved from Cornell and started his lab down at Columbia. And so you had this like five-year window where everyone who went through their PhDs at that time was really dialed in to the sort of emerging complex systems questions, emerging networks questions. And, uh, and it really created an interdisciplinary feeling and also a sense of camaraderie among the sociologists who are kind of all conversant with one another and you know attempting to move the discipline forward. So I feel like I have this great cohort of people that I can talk to who like understand what this 
initiative is to sort of move sociology in a particular direction. Um, and then I, you know, went on the job market and uh, I considered social departments, um, which were all great. I really liked visiting the social departments and um, they're very warm and welcoming. And the real question for me at that time was, where can I do like the work that I want to do? Um, and so it wound up being a little bit easier to think about that in the context of a, of a business school, so Stanford GSB and MIT Sloan. I went up ultimately choosing MIT Sloan. Um, so it felt like a place where there was going to be more action around the kind of ideas that I was thinking about in complex systems and then how they resonated with things like economic sociology. Um, and then really the move to, to Annenberg and to Penn more generally was because I wanted to start a bigger research center. So it's called the Network Dynamics Group, as you said. And the ambition there was uh, I'd been in lots of labs. I'd been in um, with the lab that Steve Storgatz ran, and I visited down at Columbia, and I was in the lab that Duncan ran when he was there. And I was um, then I was, you know, did a fellowship at, at Harvard, and I was um, in Nicholas Christakis's lab. So I kind of saw all these different lab models, and uh, and I wanted to start my own. And I had a kind of conception of of what each person had done, how they ran their labs, and I had sort of a vision of what I wanted to do. Uh, there's not a really good model or template in social science the way there is in biology. So, you know, there's like a lot of thinking you need to do to decide. And some of it is actually sociological. Like, like what's the group size? What are the social dynamics going to be? What's going to be productive? What's going to be inhibited? Mm -hmm. um, so I did a lot of, you know, sort of back of the envelope sociology to just kind of figure out what I thought would be the best structure for the lab group. Um, and Annenberg is a, just a fantastic home because... Uh, they were excited. I think they were ready to make the move. They didn't have people really working in this space and they were ready to make the move. And the Dean at the time really had a vision for where he wanted the school to go. Um, and so he and I started a conversation and it was clear that he and I basically had the same exact vision, like for the Annenberg school, uh, where I, I want to build these things and it would go in this direction. And this is the kind of support I would need. Um, and he was, he was like, that's where I want the school to go. So it was, uh, a uh, fruitful and um, really kind of welcome uh, change from being in, I mean, I love Sloan, but it was a business school to coming to a place that was like completely dedicated to PhD research and, 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 and letting faculty build centers around that. So um, anyway, that's, that is how I wound up at Penn. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, I wrote down many things you mentioned there that I noted that were notable or valuable. Let me bring up a few of them because there's a lot there that just from little items like I take note of. One, Stephen Strogatz and Nicholas Christakis, I have spoken with both of them. They're very warm, giving people. These are the individuals we can connect with because the base has to be from those who are the most giving and then it trickles down. So that's a cool concept that you work with them. There's so many things you mentioned. The SFI Institute, wonderful dis multidisciplinary, how it's nonlinear. I've spoken with a few people like Jeffrey West and others who are have yeah. gone there. And well, Jeffrey Rash from right, Random Place, yeah. yeah. Um, and I like that that mindset is the people I most connect with as well because it's non linear, it's connecting this concept to that concept, highly appealing. And uh, mentioned there, the uh, I like that you mentioned the window of time you had a period of time where uh, you noticed like there was a five year period or something where things were going on. I remember one time a rapper said, we have this window of time where all six of us are going to put out albums. And there was like a big blast of albums at the same time. Usually there's moments of energy or effort in one category. And those moments are, you have to go at those times or else they will float away and be lost. It's true. I mean, it's true historically. And it's always hard to know whether, you know, whether we construct that after the fact, because it's a convenient narrative, but in almost all fields, you hear these stories, right? In major developments in physics, you know, you find out they were like all part of the Royal Academy at the same time. You know, like Haley and Newton and um, Huygens and all these people were hanging out and Newton, Newton's parents knew Descartes. And like, they were all part of this kind of cluster of intellectuals working on a problem at the same time. And so it, you know, there was lots of uh, productive work. Um, and then you find this also in like literature there are times when like C.S. Lewis and Tolkien were at Oxford at the same time or, you know, Coleridge and Tennyson. And so you, you find these like um, focal points, right, historically. And at least from a narrative point of view, it's really compelling to attribute, <laughs> you know, major intellectual growth to, to those kinds of moments. Um, I don't know that we've done any kind of scientific test of it, but 
but definitely it felt different, you know, moving um, into that PhD program and just having so many colleagues, even the ones who weren't mathematically inclined, the people who are just doing like good old fashioned sociology, they were, you know, directly conversant with me over in the complex systems program who was, you know, going back and forth between doing like these two degrees at the same time, um, because we were all thinking about, you know, collective behavior, collective action, social movements. And it was, it was a, a conversation that was across many different people. And then you had the same conversation at Columbia. It's not until you go on the job market, you start giving job talks at like other schools like Wisconsin and Northwestern, which, you know, part of what's so awakening about that is first of all, um, the culture of those places is really different. And in some places really welcoming. You're like, this is a really wonderful culture. Um, but also the literature they engage with and the problems they talk about were like different problems. And that was really when you start to realize you're like, oh, we really had a special little you know, window where it was like these five years, this cohort that went through all at the same time with, you know, a couple of, um, uh, you know, important intellectuals who are contributing to the sort of, you know, pedagogy of both schools. Um, and then supporting Michael Macy, Doug Hackathon, a bunch of people who are like supporting this and engaging with it. Um, and I organized like a, in I think in my first semester at Cornell, like a complex systems reading group. And it was like the faculty, you never see this when you're a grad student, but the faculty were like jumping to get involved. They were like, oh, I want to give a talk in your complex systems reading. It was just a bunch of people sitting around in a room reading complex systems papers. But, um, it was, you know, it was incredibly high level. It was like the top people in, in the biology department, in the physics department, in the electrical chemical engineering department, like coming over and talking about like their version of networks because it was all so new that it was like fun for people to sort of talk about how they were rendering what they were doing in a networks framework. And then you could see all these kinds of analogies. So it just became a, a time when a lot of the traditional status barriers to that kind of work were you know, had dissipated a bit just out of like raw intellectual curiosity. Um, those status barriers are a way of building back up over time. But, uh, but yeah, it was a kind of a special time. A few concepts there. It makes me think of punctuated equilibrium. There's periods of action <laughs> and there's like dormant periods. Right. And then how you said the comparison when you went to other group and you saw what it was like compared to yours. Sometimes we need those external comparison points so that, oh, okay, this is what was happening. You can realize what you were doing versus the external world. Maybe it was more um, dormant. And then I want to go to the, you described that you created a reading book uh, group, and then you had the, you have the network dynamics group. It seems like you have created groups in multiple occasions. What led you to that? Is it like you were appointed or you realized this is an opportunity I have to take and make things for somebody well, else. In grad school, I should have asked this before we started, but what was your background? Have you been through grad school? Are you currently in grad school? Or? I did biochemistry bachelor's at UC Santa Barbara. Oh, okay. All right. So just FYI, if you do, if you do a PhD, um, one of the things to know is that, you know, all learning is autodidactic, right? So everything you get out of your PhD will really be what you create, either the conversations you seek out with your mentor or, um, the, the little discussion groups you start or, you know, your engagement with your colleagues. Um, but it's primarily like this self-driven thing and that's normal. I mean, anyone who's going to succeed in academics has to be like that, you know? Um, but there are structures that support that more than others. And one of the nice things about Cornell is it's got a kind of fluid structure. So it was no big deal for me to go over take and take classes in, um, statistical physics or evolutionary biology. That was just, you know, like it's very low barriers. Um, and then when you wanted to sort of have a conversation, it was very easy to say, just kind of tap faculty and say, Hey, we're starting this thing. Do you want to be part of it? And there, you know, it was very easy for them to say, sure, I'll show, you know, I'll show up. And then there's this group of people, like half of whom we never met. And a lot of whom were meeting each other because they, you know, don't see each other on campus because they're from different buildings. Um, and so that kind of thing is really easy to organize. Uh, then when you obviously move up in rank, it's a little different because instead of being, when you're a grad student and you do this kind of thing, it's like the faculty are all sort of appreciative that you're doing something in addition to your grad studies. When you're a faculty and you're organizing this, it's for the grad students mostly and then for other faculty. Mm -hmm. And so you have a sense of um, responsibility. Like when you're running this kind of thing, it's not just for my own intellectual edification. It's also 
you know, pedagogically useful for the students who are there, right? So we, we um, particularly in sociology, I think that the faculty take uh, very good care of the grad students. Like we really, it matters how they're progressing, how they're doing. We don't just want them kind of sitting in the corner of the room while a bunch of, you know, big heads talk, right? And so there's more of a, a management structure when you're doing that as, you know, a, the director of a research lab. Um, but the exciting thing when you're doing it as director of a research lab is that all the conversations are focused on, instead of just being general conversations about let's learn about this, let's learn about that, they're all focused on, you know, projects we're working on. And that really kind of congeals the conversation and brings everyone together, which is, of course, you know, what makes it exciting. It's like a bunch of people, you know, uh, it's a team, really, working on a project together. A lot of the coolest things come from a team coming together. We can only do so much as one individual. And that connects to the concept, let's say a person would like to make change, which actually, I would also add in what percent of people really would want to versus a small group that might. How do you make big things happen? How does one affect change as a human on this earth? Yeah, so um, I would say that the, one of the main perspectives in this book um, is to reorient people to what could be called a sociological perspective. I think it's very um, familiar, and I also think that many of the books published in the space of change are published from an, a psychological perspective. And one reason, reason for that is that psychology is easily accessible. We all understand that you know, we're people with brains and personalities, and we spend a lot of time thinking about that, and we a lot of time thinking about other people's personalities, and we think about strategy, we're thinking about how to manage or negotiate or compete with other people. And it's it's uh, this individualistic model, right? This is, which is often referred to as methodological individualism, right? And so this is an approach that is, um, there have been some really sophisticated uh, technical projects in economics, uh, but also in other fields that have explored this, uh, this avenue of, of methodological individualism. Sociology is kind of a different branch intellectually. There are certainly some models and some approaches that are based on methodological individualism, but by and large, the major move that, particularly the move that, that's responsible for the dovetailing of sociology with complex systems is the move to say, when people are moving as individuals, they aren't actually moving as individuals. They're making decisions, and what's happening is that there are influences around them and their decisions are reciprocally affecting the people who are influencing them. So there's this kind of organic whole. And, you know, people make lots of analogies to biological systems and ecologies and so forth. But the thing is that the human social system is its own kind of scientific entity. And so now the question is, well, how do we most effectively study that? So in many ways, what brought this book to life was all of the thinking I've been doing over the last like decade or 15 years has been focused on this question of um, changing behavior, but from the perspective of how it's mediated by the networks that we're in. Where I think of networks just as the pattern of connections of who talks to whom or who interacts with whom or who influences whom, but they have an underlying geometry. They've got a structure to them. And so before we say, what can I do? It's, it's, it's important to take a step back and say, well, what's our, what's our best science? What do we actually know about the world? Um, before saying like, how can I change it? That's ultimately where we want to get to, absolutely, is what are our bullet points? But before you get to bullet points, you have to say, am I asking the right question? Is how can I change it actually the right question? Even though it's the intuitive question, it may, you know, in terms of our best science, not be a coherent question. And so part of the point of the book was to kind of shift the conversation about change from a kind of individual or sort of psychological perspective about um, what I do or I think to this sort of collective process that's happening all around us all the time. We're always invested in it. We're always um, being affected by it and affecting it. And how, that seems really complicated. And it seems really sort of overwhelming and almost like it challenges notions of free will. It seems like a, a very kind of um, difficult space to get into for someone who just like wants to know what to do. Um, and so this book was written in, in really with the goal of making that conceptual move much easier 
something, a conceptual move that could be like much more intelligible and then also much more satisfying. Because you could say, oh, when I, there is actually a, a pattern or a geometry that I'm embedded in, but that doesn't mean I'm helpless. It doesn't mean that, that like I'm being controlled by structures that I, I can't see and I can't do anything with. It means that they are there and there are influences flowing through them, but I can engage with that. I can kind of get into them in the right way. And you can start to you know see them and see how to engage with them. Um, and the, really, the, as the book matures, um, I start off by talking about some of the classic myths, like the myth of the influencer and the myth of reality, which obviously play a huge role in how we think about social change these days. Um, you notice that the government, as of yesterday, I think there's not been the New York Times, but they're using influencers to address the you know the vaccination problem, which is based on the intuition that like if you just get a high profile high profile person, everyone they see will see that they're doing something like getting vaccinated and then get vaccinated. It's a, it's a very kind of one-to-one -one model of individual psychology and collective change. So um, that's not really what our best science tells us. So one of the ideas behind this book and behind you know, everything coming after it is, well, if I give you a different understanding, which is closer to what we actually understand about um, the way that social change spreads and the way that the networks sort of control that spreading process, then what can you do to engage it? And there are a couple of like strategies at the organizational level, like what could an organizational manager do in terms of structuring their teams or structuring their sort of workplace in a way that would amplify their sort of responsiveness to innovation. And that's really straightforward because that's one of the places where when we think about the structure of connections or the pattern of messaging and communication, there is actually some fairly straightforward um, institutional control over people's um, communication networks and over their kind of regular meetings that could be implemented in a way that would be really beneficial, that would allow them to solve a lot of the problems that the people encounter. Um, and like, I'm talking about problems like, you know, when there's a merger, how do you integrate cultures? When there's a change in culture, like addressing sexual harassment um, within an organization. When there's uh, a set of new innovations that nobody wants to adopt. And there's a set of new management principles that people have tried out but have failed. And, you know, organizations, I mean, you know, billion dollar organizations are, I'm surprised to the degree that the problems that like NGOs and public health offices face are like, exactly the same problem <laughs> like billion dollar organization space it's all about just managing people effectively and it's largely about the structures in which those people are embedded that makes them either work well or work poorly um and so uh and so that's kind of a generalizable set of lessons and then and then we move to you know the person in their community and say well what can you do um and that's i think the the big punchline is like, well, if we're not talking about individual psychology, we're talking about these social structures, what can any one person do? And there are kind of three things that I point out. One is that you might think that the people who are highly connected, who've got a lot of social status are the people who are, you know, the originators of change, but all of the data from all the change processes that we've been able to study systematically, um, and the most recent data, of course, are from social media, but we have other data. Um, even back to the civil rights movement. And all the data show one consistent thing, which is that the origin points for major change movements are coming from like regular folks, modestly connected folks out in what I refer to as the network periphery. And that change process then originates with people whom we can pinpoint in a network, even though they don't seem relatively important, which means it's, it's us or the people we know. And so the question is, well, then how do we activate that? And then that becomes actually just a really basic practical question. You say, okay, if you had a community meeting, make sure these people are at the community meeting, make sure that the community meeting has representation from these different groups. So you have you know, these connections to different groups that are relevant. And then initiate a change within this group and maintain it. And that's one of the things that people often sort of, I think, do incorrectly when they're trying to get these kinds of change processes off the ground is they want lots of different people from everywhere. So they get like massive exposure for their new idea. But there's an irony of that, which is that if you have massive exposure so that everyone who's sort of going around proselytizing for it is in their own different community, that also means that each of these people is surrounded by people who are not doing this thing who may oppose it. 
So there's just a ton of countervailing pressure and it kind of crushes that incentive. Whereas if you group the people together who are initiating this idea, um, they can provide each other support while simultaneously coordinating to help bring others on board. Um, and it's, it's counterintuitive. When you look at a network map and you adopt this strategy, like why am I coordinating all my efforts in one small spot? That seems like a waste of resources. But it is the crucial difference between spreading behavior change, which requires this kind of social reinforcement, social proof um, process, rather than spreading something like an informational contagion, like a piece of news, which jumps around the world just like gossip or just like a virus. But real behavior change obviously doesn't spread that way because we hear news every day and we don't change our lifestyle, right? So the question is, well, what gets us to change our lifestyle? And so, the question, I think the answer to that is really taking a, a sort of a better understanding of the networks around you and then figuring out where you're located and then how to kind of harness the community that's immediately around you and connected to you. Um, and so the book kind of ends with some, some practical steps. Here are seven strategies you can use for kind of building those kind of um, community initiation points or incubators uh, around you or in communities nearby. Mm -hmm. I brought up a few great, there's some great points in the book, I must say, as far as uh, I like the graphs with like strong ties and weak ties. And uh, the point you just mentioned is informative because it's motivating to the average individual when they see, wait a minute, some things that are spread, I have to be a part of it. That's the way they tend to work, the regular person. So that is a positive thing to take in because, oh, okay, I, I, I should be part of this versus it has to be from up there. Cristiano Ronaldo has to start it and then it has to pass on to the rest, something I'm naming some individual. And so it's a little bit more inspiring from within. I also like that you mentioned that there's people issues at the large scale and those same people issues at the smaller scale because we run the same way regardless of the dynamic around us. I mean, we have influences, but our baseline is the same. One thing about um, behavioral change, is it like we have to have packets of people that um, like we need like a power force of groups of people to get behavioral change across, whereas information will just uh, get there if it's interesting enough. But for behavior, we, we need like groups, energy. It's like a packet of hundreds of people that support a thing before it can actually be a change in behavior? Yeah, the, the, the best way I think that the, the graphics in the book do a lot of work, and so I don't, we're not doing a show and tell here, but the reason I, I actually didn't want to include graphics originally because I felt like the, the language should convey the concepts, but um, the figures or the, the images, I think, are very powerful because they take something that can seem abstract and once you look at it, you say, oh, right, that's, okay, this is what weak ties look like, and this is what influencers, you know, quote, unquote, look like, and this is what the parts of the network where actually change happens look like, and they look really different. And that's just, you know, is, is sort of immediately um, compelling kind of evidence. Um, one of the concepts I think is super helpful for kind of unpacking the question you're asking is just the fact that we're talking about spreading, right? We're talking about going from some person or group of people to lots of other people. And so the key question becomes, what is spreading and what is it spreading across? Right? Um, and so if a piece of news is spreading, what we're talking about is, okay, I, I know a fact, right? I know that Princess Diana died. Someone who knows a lot of people, once they announce it, then a lot of people know it, right? And, and that's, the intuition that uh, essentially when we're looking at a spreading process, we're basically looking at a bunch of links in a network. And what we're looking at is how whatever we're spreading, like the, the contagion, in this case would be this piece of news about Princess Diana, um, jumps from link to link to link to link to link. Then it hits a link that's connected to a lot of other links. And then it, you know, uh, spreads out or a node that's connected to a lot of links and it spreads out across the, um, the social universe. And uh, that is what we refer to as viral spreading because that's pretty much how COVID-19 spreads. It's contact, contact, contact. One person who's highly connected gets it and they infect a lot of people, right? Um, and, uh, and then the question is um, that 
model, okay, so a viral spreading or information spreading doesn't really work very well for understanding how a person makes a decision to get vaccinated or how a person makes a decision to um, join a protest rally. Mm -hmm. It's not just that you hear about it. You have to believe that it's like something good for you to do. Right. Um, and so the question is, what's, what is that difference? And then, and then when it comes to spreading processes, which is tantamount to change, um, then how does that happen? And does it happen in a different way? And the answer is yes. So the single tie from me to you that conveys this new fact, Princess Diana has died, um, is uh, sufficient for spreading that. Or if you and I were to stand in a small room, shake hands and talk without face masks, it would also be sufficient for COVID-19 transmission, right? Now the question is, what is sufficient for transmitting um, someone's participation in a social revolution to somebody else. You say, okay, now that person got so excited about this Black Lives Matter protest, they're going to go out and protest too. Um, and so is the next person they talk to, and so is the next person they talk to. Right? There's going to be this chain of spreading and, and social activism um, that's just like the spread of news about Princess Di. And the answer is, well, the difference between those two things is that it only takes a single link in the social chain, which is to say the weak tie, to find out about Princess Diana. But in order to spread from one person to another, any kind of real behavioral change requires more than one link. And so it requires a redundant, basically, bridge. And so the concept of bridge width, the bridges between people, the bridges that connect our society, the bridges that leap across nations, the bridges that basically bind our social world together, some bridges are narrow and some bridges are wide. And that just means there's more people who are connected across groups. There's more people who, once they affirm an idea, can help convince people from a different group that that idea is a good idea. And that difference between a weak tie and a group of strong ties or a wider bridge turns out to be this crucial network distinction um, that cuts across everything. So we actually just had a paper come out last week in Nature Communication that took this idea from the book and then developed a mathematical, um, essentially a, a derivation that identified the exact neighborhood in every single network for any kind of contagion that would be like the central network neighborhood for seeding a contagion. And that's a big deal because traditionally we just say, oh, we're the most highly connected person. And we have technical fine points. Um, anyone who does networks research listening to this would say, oh yeah, well, we also have eigenvector centrality or betweenness centrality or population centrality, k-core centrality. We have all these measures of where the center of the network is. But what they boil down to is that center spot would be the spot, whoever's locating it, that person's the person to go to for spreading stuff because they're most centrally located. And what we discovered was by applying the work in the book to a network graph analysis that was dedicated to just pinpointing central spots, that when it comes to these sort of behavioral contagions, which I call complex contagions, that actually the central spot in the network is actually way out on what looks like the edge. But that is now the new center of the network. And now all of a sudden it makes sense why change comes from those spots. Because for that kind of process, which has to spread through wider bridges, the, the center of the network is now um, in a place that is completely counterintuitive given everything we know about viral spreading. Nevertheless, we can identify it, we can pinpoint it, we can target it. And I think that's what, you know, that's what's really exciting. And so that's something that requires a bit of knowledge about, about what the structure of the network looks like. But, um, you know, I have chapters in the book where I talk about people applying exactly this strategy in a cup, a colleague of mine had read this early work and suggesting, you know, in which I suggested there would be this key spots. Um, and, uh, and she went to Malawi and de designed an experiment <laughs> where she divided the entire country, you know, to these, sort of 200 experimental cases, and then used each village, um, I think 50 villages per experimental condition, to try to initiate a change in their um, uh, farming practices to make them more sustainable. That's a big change. I mean, they've been using the same farming practices for generations. The idea that a social contagion process 
just by seeding a couple of people with this new idea would have any impact at all on like, you know, nationwide farming practices was you know, ambitious. Um, but they were able to show that in the networks where, which is basically in the group of 50 villages where they tried to use this sort of complexity strategy of identifying uh, seed nodes, it was just far more effective, like hundreds of times more effective than um, doing the influencer strategy or randomly seeding strategies. And so what that tells you is that there's a way of applying this kind of network science at a large scale to initiate, you know, social change and behavior change more broadly. I like this. It's almost like locating actual centers or points of value versus what appears to be centers or main links to outside forces. It's great because it's almost like seeing something that's not there, but is actually there after the fact. It's always obvious after the fact, which is an interesting concept. Yeah. Yeah. One well, thing- that's why the, the paper, like I just said, the paper we just put out uh, the last week, um, uh, Nature Communications, this, this paper uh, does the, the thing that, that I think should be done, which is that we make a prediction. We say, okay, we've derived all this stuff. This is what we predict. And then we go and get a, a really good data set and then just evaluate our prediction. And then that's why it's like exciting because the model matches perfectly with the most influential places. Yeah. One thing that comes to mind is when we are using the large scale programs or apps that connect people online on their end, or even from someone looking at their data, that's not even part of their company. Is it starting to become super obvious how things are spreading or being shared? Like the things that people do are highly predictable at this point. So um, there are two challenges. One is, you know, data clarity. Um, with those data, you don't really know exactly which influences are around people. You know, in the you know in the subset of that particular company's database, what influences are around them, but you don't know what other people they're talking to on other platforms or in other contexts, right? So um, it's always hard in, a, in an uncontrolled environment to make the right kinds of causal inferences about what's, you know, what's causing what, how are things are spreading. And then more generally, observational data are tricky just because there's all kinds of things happening. Um, in general, spreading processes happen on a faster time scale than network rearrangement processes. But it's true that in those spaces, people are adding and dropping ties. And so it's also hard to make inferences about what the ultimate pattern of diffusion was or spreading was when you see people connected to more people who have adopted, it could be the fact that they're changing ties to connect to people who are adopted. Um, and so this is always one of the challenges with you know, scientific inference from observational data. It's one of the reasons why I focus almost exclusively on experiments, right? Is because I feel like I, the, my ambition is to develop you know, these, these theoretical predictive models and then to be able to evaluate them. And, and make sort of you know strong uh, causal claims about the effects of these networks on people's behavior, um, which you can only do in a sort of properly controlled way. Um, so in terms of prediction, I would say that yes, there are some settings in which now we, we can actually make very strong predictions. Um, it's important to note that I use prediction, I think differently. A lot of people use the word prediction in a correlational sense. And this is true in machine learning and in you know, computer science and also has been true in sociology where people say things like, um, you know, variable X predicts variable Y. And what they really mean is that in the data, X is correlated with Y. And that correlation is consistent and it's got, you know, regularity that gives us a significant p-value. And so then a kind of shorthand for that is X predicts Y. And it's always a little frustrating to me because the notion of prediction that I believe in is one of sort of counterfactual intervention, right? Which is to say, if I were to change the world in a specific way, think now of any public policy and intervene, would I be able to produce the outcome that I desire, right? If I were to um, change our tax rate, how would that affect gross national spending, gross national productivity, wealth inequality, if I were to um, 
change the uh, the rules about you know um, the number of uh, days that we work a week or the number of you know the number of um, hours that we spend in the office a day. How would that affect productivity of these organizations? Right. So these are causal claims. These are like if I made this policy change, people would behave differently and the world would look different, right? right. And this is by and large what the field of sociology is based on is like big claims about how the institutions and the rules of our society affect, you know, race uh, inequality, gender inequality, massive wealth inequality, like that there are reasons why we see the world the way it is and that those reasons are largely governed by some of the choices we've made in terms of designing our world. And if we change some of the rules um, and designed our world in a slightly different way, that the world would look different. That is a very difficult concept for a lot of people to wrap their heads around, partly because everyone makes natural inferences. They say, oh, I see a kind of social pecking order. I see a hierarchy. There must be a reason for that, right? Well, either God ordained it, or it's just because some people are better than others, but it's just that simple. And so the fact that it's really just not that simple, um, and there, there's an you know, entire scientific field dedicated to unpacking what those rules are, and the fact that those structures, when they change, can dismantle some well understood and very familiar power structures um, is scary, right? It means that the things that you think are, you know, permanent features of the world aren't actually permanent features of the world, right? And so that's the point of view of a, you know, the sociological science, and again, dovetails very nicely with complex systems. Um, and to the point of punctuated equilibrium you brought up earlier, is that a system can be stable and consistent for a long time. And then all of a sudden, there can be a shift in the underlying properties, you know, as we talk about a control parameter, but like underlying properties of the system. And then very abruptly, the entire system looks different, right? And that's a, that's a punctuated equilibrium. And what's, what's hard about, and we see this all the time in, in physical and biological systems, we also see it in social systems. Rappaport did some really great work on this, um, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and, uh, and our own work has shown similar kinds of results where when we change a network structure, we see this like punctuated jump in the, the behavior of the entire system as a whole. Um, and we also see it with, you know, the kinds of sort of collective change processes and social mobilization processes. One of the things that people talk about the most these days are tipping points. And what a tipping point really is, and this is, you know, there's a, as you know, an entire set of chapters in the book, they're just dedicated to like showing how tipping points work and showing how what sits underneath a tipping point is a network dynamic that builds in exactly the way I described. It builds from these sort of groups and these wide bridges between groups in a slow way. And then once it reaches a critical mass, there's this sort of punctuated jump. And then very quickly, large numbers of people in society are all coordinating on a brand new behavior. Obviously, we've seen social norms around Black Lives Matter change dramatically. Back in 2014 with Eric Gardner's death, you know, his death was videotaped and it was posted on the internet. And there were basically like 400 tweets about it and some small protests. And then six years later, George Floyd's death was videotaped and posted on the internet. And there was like a worldwide protest and Congress start, you know, had like a national referendum on police violence, right? So you know, what happened in those six years to change like, you know, a century of violence that nothing really could undo or alter. Um, and so you see this radical change, not just in public action, but also in public opinion. You know, back in 2014, with the death of Eric Gardner, people were interviewed and there was uh, a survey result showing that like very few people actually thought the protests were justified. And then in 2020, Americans were interviewed and Almost 80% of Republicans and Democrats said that the protests were justified and that they supported Black Lives Matter. And again, that's a huge shift in public consciousness in a very short time. And we've seen this again with the you know, acceptance and legalization of marijuana. We've seen that, right? We've seen all of these major cultural shifts. But we what we notice is that they happen really fast. And what we don't notice is there's this long, slow growth curve, which is that beginning part of it sort of growing steam and the sort of edges across these bridges in the network until it gets big enough that then it sort of cascades across the center. 
And that gives us a, a really, I think, very compelling picture of how one person makes a difference, which is the people in the periphery aren't individually standing up and, you know, um, making a name that's going to be the famous name associated with the One Social Change Movement. In fact, what happens is that collectively they grow a movement that's so um, large and so well represented that other people don't have a choice but to engage with it. And even you'll see with Black Lives Matter, you'll see the evolution of the network dynamics on Twitter of Black Lives Matter. There's a point at which the conservatives are ignoring, with, ignoring it and then they're kind of hostile to it. And then as it grows and as the sort of networks expand and they become, the bridges become wider and the conversation becomes thicker, um, the conservatives are now in, engaging with Black Lives Matter in like a non-confrontational way, in like a legitimate, you know, um, conversation about what the questions are and the problems are. Uh, anyway, the point is that there's a, there's a very uh, exciting science behind being able to understand these things that have always seemed like, you know, out of nowhere, abrupt social changes. There's a fairly systematic way of understanding these as a growth process in the social network. Yes. I like the punctuated equilibrium that builds to a point. That's the point where I like to look at things and analyze them because those moments of stability for five years, I can't find it that exciting, but the points where there's a shift and everybody's adjusting and the base is changing to me, that's more, there's room to adjust things. There's room to have more of an impact versus when things become stable in that category. It's already set. Everybody's like, this is, I'm in the fast lane. You're in the third lane. I'm in the second lane on the freeway. I kind of see this happen. Sometimes there'll be a little bit of a dormant period. One thing you mentioned there was you focused on the term prediction very carefully. And I've noticed that that's a great quality I've seen in professors or scientists that words are very important. I had talked with professor Cronin at University of Glasgow, he's a chemistry department head, and he was focused on a few terms like emergence and time. Who are some people who have been important to you as a role model or influence in science or your research? I would say the, the largest role model I've had is, do you know Mark Granovetter? I guess you've heard that name, it comes up a few times. Um, but Mark Granovetter is the, the sociologist who originally coined the term strength of weak ties. And um, he was the person who really took a lot of the intuitions that people had about networks and about how they operate um, and made them all really concrete. He made them very clear and his argumentation style has a kind of lucidity to it that uh, transcends contemporary sociology. Contemporary sociology has to be like very invested in you know, I'm working on my problem, my problem's important because immigration's important. I'm working on my problem, my problem's important because race and gender equity is important. And all, of course, those problems are important, but I think sociology's be become tracked so that when scientists are writing about these problems, they don't feel an obligation to speak about what the broader implication is for the movement of the science around the sort of strategies they're adopting. Um, and what Granovetter did was to really take a very broad view of what the big implication was for social networks for thinking about all the large questions, um, social change, economic development, uh, norm change, uh, equity, immigration, like he, he looked at all of these things in a very broad lens and was able to talk about them in a way that was so precise and so consistent with, you know, concepts that have been around since the 50s, like path length, which is, you know, a measure of the distance between nodes and network originally developed by Salomano from Rappaport. Um, and he was able to take them all and put them into like a very clear, concrete sociological space and then spin out these major implications. So his paper is the most cited paper in the entire field of sociology. It's like that influential. Um, my work is a direct response to his work in the sense that it builds on it, challenges some of his assumptions. You know, the thesis that weak ties spread everything is, of course, one of the theses that comes out of Granovetter's work, and that's one of the theses that I challenge in my work and say, actually, these weak ties really aren't effective for spreading these kinds of social contagions. We need to think about the width, width of social bridges. Um, but he's still, you know, the only reason I'm able to do this work is because of the clarity of his work, right? It's whenever you're, you're 
able to sort of understand a problem well enough um, to challenge a, a scientist who's come before you, it's because that scientist did so much good work that the problem actually is a clearer, more well-defined problem now because of the work they did. Um, so science is ever evolving. And I think that, you know, one of the sort of greatest things that had happened to me was that when I wrote my first book on this, you know, Mark Granover was one of the first people to write an endorsement of it, which I found to be a testimony, not just to the quality of his thinking, but also the quality of his character. It was like the kind of person who, instead of like doubling down on what, what one of the papers that made him most famous said, oh, this is a really important innovation. I think this is great work. And that's just the, the sign, I think, of, a, of a, um, the kind of classical notion of, of scientists working together to try to understand the world and how it works. I like that. It's like a positive connection to the future, not stuck on ego. And I like that you mentioned the clarity of what he did allowed for what you do. The amount of detail we put into what we are doing and examination, it can apply today but it can also 20 years from now apply to someone we didn't even plan for. And still the depth of the work is relevant. Anything I always think of anything we leave undone is canceling out um, lots of compound building on that in the future. So it's not for us to do. That's great. Yeah. I, like yeah, I think it's one of the reasons why we still read the classics, you know, even though they're, um, particular results are, of course, you know, outdated. Um, I, you know, spend time in the philosophy of science. I, I read the Principia cover to cover. Nobody reads the Principia. Uh, uh -huh. and, the, and the Galileo and the Kepler, and it's like, and, and the Aristotle and the Galen. And like, one of the reasons for reading that stuff isn't because they're you know, going to learn new science, like the science is way behind, but it's that reasoning process. And like, there's always, what makes a classic a classic is like, there's this spark of clarity. And it's, you just feel the sense of recognition and, you know, appreciation in seeing that, you know, ability to maneuver through a space that was more complicated and messier and come out with something that's, um, you know, much more incisive and, you know, frankly, more beautiful. And then that gives more people more work to do. And you can see that in, in a good work. And I think Granovetter's work has that quality to it. Yes. It made me think of like, Marcus Aurelius and those philosophers, sometimes I'll read their material and it's like, they're talking to me from a house right there and, oh, okay, this is something that makes sense, but you're from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Yeah, mountaintop to mountaintop. The, right. the yeah. link is never broken. Right. I would like to thank you for having been on this episode. What is one message you would tell all the people of the planet about what you would want them to know from your book? Um. I think that the most important thing that comes out of the book is that, you know, when we think about social influence on a large scale, almost always, it really starts with people in neighborhoods, people talking to each other and decisions we make about how we collect together and whom we interact with have these ramifications that are impossible to know ahead of time. And so the principles in the book are principles for making decisions that help to build critical mass around change issues, even though it's not obvious initially. And there's that huge part of this science that I think is just essential for people to understand. It's a, it's a, the impact they're having isn't obvious at first. That makes sense. Professor Damon Santola, author of Change, How to Make thing, Big Things Happen. I would like to thank you for having been on this episode of the show. Thanks, Armin. My pleasure. Take care. And we are out.